Happy holidays. I figure everyone needs some tardigrade Evo Devo for Christmas. So let's talk about water bears. What everyone seems to know about them is that they're extremely hardy. They can live in space. They can survive hard radiation. They can be completely dehydrated. I don't find that as interesting as how they evolve, though. So I'm going to tell you about some recent information on their molecular genetics. Before I can do that, though, I have to tell you about segmented body plans. And before I do that, I have to tell you where tardigrades fit into the grand evolutionary scheme. So let's look at a little systematics first. Tardigrades are members of the superorder Panarthropoda, which includes another odd creature, the velvet worm, or a nicophorin, and the more familiar horde of arthropods, crustaceans, spiders, millipedes, centipedes, and insects. They're all members of the clade Ectysozoa, that means they molt their cuticles, and they also have paired clawed limbs, and most importantly for the topic today, they are segmented. Their bodies are metameric, made up of repeated rings. Here, for example, is a velvet worm, that anicophoran I mentioned a moment ago. And it's obvious how its body is made of repeated segments, each with a stumpy little limb attached. Or take, for example, a millipede, a true arthropod with two pairs of legs in each metamer. Metamerism is a common strategy for building larger, more complex body plans. Insert more segments, each pretty much the same as the other, and you get bigger and longer without having to invent anything new. Lots of organisms use this strategy, not just panarthropods. Annelids like this earthworm are not arthropods at all, but they also build up a body out of repeated segmental rings. Likewise, vertebrates like you are also made of repeated elements. You have 33 vertebrae in chain, and as an early embryo, you looked more like a worm than you do now. I hope. But if you're thinking like a developmental biologist, the first question in your head might be, how do arthropods make so many segments? And there are basically two ways it is done. Arthropod embryos after gastrulation form a strip of relatively undifferentiated cells called the germ band. In highly derived insects like the fruit fly Drosophila, this initial germ band represents the entire length of the animal from head to tail tip. Then, almost simultaneously, all 14 segments of the fly form, expressing a collection of interacting genes in a beautiful striped pattern. Because the entire length of the animal is expressed in the germ band from the very beginning, these are called long germ band insects. As I mentioned though, this is a derived pattern and is specialized for rapid development. The long germ band insects evolve from another group of ancestral insects called the short germ band insects. Short germ band insects, like grasshoppers for example, have embryos that first form a germ band that includes the head and maybe the thorax. The whole thorax and abdomen are not represented. Instead, there's an undifferentiated bit of tissue called the growth zone or proliferation zone. As the embryo develops, this zone will grow and new segments will be added sequentially from front to back. So our grasshopper embryo starts out as just a head with a small number of appendages hanging from it, which will eventually become the mouthparts and antennae. Hmm, just a head. You might be getting some hints about where this story is going. But wait, there's one more bit of background I have to give you. You get the idea of metamerism, just making more segments. But we have to do one more thing. We have to specialize segments. Obviously, in an insect, you're going to have a head end that looks different from the tail end, and you're going to have a thorax with legs and an abdomen without legs. Each segment has to have a unique identity conferred upon it, and that's the job of another set of genes, the segment identity genes, or to use a name you may find more familiar, the Hox genes. These genes are switched on in a spe specific spatial pattern after the segments form, and they assign specific roles to each segment. To start out simple, an animal like a leech, an annelid, is made of repeating segments, and most of the segments are fairly similar. They all contain a nerve ganglion and nerves branching out of them to innervate skin and muscle. 
But several of the ganglia in the anterior end are different and fused together to make a primitive brain. Also, the tailmost ganglia similarly fuse to form a caudal ganglion, a tail brain, which is important in, for example, controlling reproductive behavior. This consolidation and fusion and specialization of regions of the body is called tagmosis. Flies also do this to an even greater extreme. Adult flies don't look worm-like at all. They fuse three middle segments to build a thorax, an integrated boxy structure, and their three thoracic ganglia and the first four abdominal ganglia fuse to make a single large thoracic ganglion. We can examine this from the perspective of evolution, too. Metamorism comes first. The earliest panarthropods would have been like the velvet worms or, the, or myriapods or larval flies, simply making lots of identical segments. So segments come first. The division of labor would have been simple, with just three Hox genes, one to specify the head. This would be something like deformed, DFD. One to specify the tail end, abdominal B. And then another to set up the great repetitious series of trunk segments, Antenopedia-like. A duplication of the Antenopedia-like gene would have allowed greater morphological diversity, generating, for instance, specialized mouth parts. Another duplication would allow differentiation of thorax versus abdomen. Yet more duplications created new specifications for the various complex parts of the insect. So now we have elaborated a fairly complex body on top of the basic repeated segments. Furthermore, we can distinguish these segments on a molecular level by looking at what segment identity or Hox genes are expressed. And that allows us to compare different species of orthropods by looking at Hox gene expression. Groovily enough, we find that these patterns are similar across all insects, even all arthropods, and somewhat surprisingly, even in chordates, who also have similar arrays of Hox genes identifying positional information in the body plan. We can predict and expect that any arthropod will express the gene labial at its front end, abdominal B in the segment containing its reproductive organs, and, for insta instance, antennapedia and ultrabithorax in the segments corresponding to the thorax. So just keep that in mind. Let's just look at these four genes. Labial at the front end, abdominal B at the back end, and antennapedia and ultrabithorax in the middle. Okay, let's finally look at tardigrade Hox genes and test this. Smith and others dug up all the Hox genes from a couple of species and compared them to other arthropods and annelids. On the left side of this map, we can see that yes, they all have labial in pink. On the right side, they all have abdominal B. And in fact, one species of tardigrade has a triple dose of abdominal B. And then we go looking for those two middle genes, antennapedia and ultrapithorax, which are colored purple. The beetle, the velvet worm, and the annelid all have them as expected. But they're missing from the tardigrades. They have the genes for the head and the genital segment, but are missing some of the hox genes in the middle. This strange absence jumps out at you when you compare the domains of expression of the hox genes. Comparing a tardigrade and a millipede, you should see that the orangey-yellow genes, that is the thoracic and abdominal genes, are broadly expressed in the millipede. In the tardigrade, they're just plain gone. The only genes used in the tardigrade are the ones that are expressed in the front end of the millipede, and one other, abdominal B, which is associated with a genital segment. It's as if we've lopped out the middle of an insect and grafted the genitals directly to its neck. If we compare the whole body of a tardigrade to the heads of a millipede, a spider, and a velvet worm, and look at the expression patterns of several important developmental genes, they line up nicely. There is an ocular segment, the bit with the eyes, and then behind that are the four pairs of limbs of the tardigrade. And they are homologous to the chelicerae, pedipalps, and first two legs of the spider, and the antenna intercalary segment 
and maxilla and mandible of the millipede. Basically, a tardigrade is a disembodied arthropod head walking around on its moth parts. We can model how this would have evolved. Remember, segments form before they're assigned an identity. So in a regime where we're selecting for small body size, an early panarthropod would have started the sequential process of building segments in the front, built the first couple of head segments, and then stopped growing. The growth zone would have differentiated directly to a genital segment by expressing abdominal B, and then the first couple of hox genes would have been expressed, but poor antennapedia and ultrabithorax would have no segments to be expressed in and would have eventually been lost as useless unexpressed genes. Isn't evolution and development fun? They constructed the compact body plan of the tardigrade by simply losing an entire middle segment of a protoarthropod. I would like to acknowledge the inspiration of many disembodied heads, including, among others, The Thing, The Android Ash, Dr. Carl Hill of Reanimator, Cromulans, and of course, the great and powerful Zardoz, who probably hated Abdominal Bee and cut it out too.